Welcome everybody to our first presentation, which is peanut butter and jelly meets keep off the grass. So today we have with us Derek Schwanbeck. He's from Ellsworth, Nebraska. Him and his wife, Lisa, have been ranching on her family's ranch in the Nebraska Sand Hills for over 25 years. If you've never been to Nebraska or seen the Sand Hills, you need to take that trip. It is absolutely beautiful. So with that, I'll, I'll introduce Derek, and I'm sure he's going to tell us lots more about their operation. Thank you. Thanks, Jana. So ooh, that, that sounds pretty good. So, um, I would encourage you to go see the Sand Hills in Nebraska. I am very blessed to live there. And it's a, yeah, there's a book out about Nebraska like no other place, and that's a very good title. Uh, the sand hills are a very specific ecology and a Ogallala aquifer, and I could go on for what I don't have enough time for. Um, so I like to be fun, and for whatever reason, when I'm in front of strangers, it's no big deal, but when I'm in front of other grazers, it's a big deal. So I'm a little nervous. I don't have any idea why. Um, peanut butter and jelly meets keep off the grass, and uh, well, we'll get into that a little bit, or maybe I should tell a story. Um, a little story. Well, well, more people show up. That things that we do are really, really simple, and then they're really, really complex. So we might be moving some grazing, moving animals. There's stockmanship and 75 other variables that we handle every day. And it might be in an Excel sheet or some program I don't know how to run, or it might be on a little tablet, or it may be bouncing around in your head, or in my case, sometimes written on the windshield in a dry erase marker. But um, in the end, it's simple. But how to, how to express that, what we do, and our passion about what we do to people that don't know what we do. So I'll get going on this. Uh, there's the story. So it's my niece, and she's checking out the cactus, the prickly pear cactus, and there's a million things we could have in there. Most people would say, oh, well, you've got cactus, and other people would say it's beautiful, and it's all perspective. Um, so here we go. Regenerative grazing is dumb. All the hard work that you people put into regenerating ag is dumber. <laughs> and and uh, so, yeah, it's kind of funny. I clicked on it too soon, but it's not funny. Does that insult anyone here? It insults myself to say it. I, I was supposed to insult you, OK? Um, but if we take our threats and, and uh, make them opportunities, how can I help you explain in three sentences, why that hurt you? Turning threats into opportunities. Um, I'll start over, because there's some old stuff, like there's nothing new under the sun. Um, this, is, uh, this is from a farmer. He was born in 1825. Oop. Uh-oh. Oh. Good. I may have skipped a slide. Comes from our heart. Here we go. Uh, it's a foreword, and it's basically a memoirs. It's a little book you can find. It's not actually published. Um, so it's a foreword about this farmer's memoirs later in life. Agriculture is basic. Upon it rest cities and commerce and civilization. There are great men who lead armies in war or regiments in peace, who succeed in business or statecraft, who write songs or make laws, who add to human knowledge or subtract from human misery. And the stories of their lives are interesting and inspiring. How much more inspiring and interesting is the story of the life of a farmer upon whose success depends all the other industries and activities of man. To tell the story of life of a plain farmer, David Rankin, humbly born, but of heroic type, to set down in his own simple, straightforward speech the secret of his great career as inspiration to farmers everywhere in, in uh, 
this book is written, all I really care about is to set down in his own simple, straightforward speech. And so this Rankin fellow was regenerative agriculture before people knew what agriculture was. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him, but he was feeding cattle corn and then turning cornfields back to grass in 1850. It's not new stuff that we do, um, but somebody in 1934 captivated that uh, setting it down in our own simple words, and that's, so if you wanted to go listen to somebody else, now you can, because that's all I'm talking about, is how to set it down in your own simple words. Um, that right there, let's take, uh, um, I'll pick on my wife a little bit. If we could get Sam Elliott or Liam Neeson to, uh, to read this, we could rival Paul Harvey's God Made a Farmer Super Bowl commercial. And it's one of the most popular Super Bowl commercials. I don't even watch Super Bowls, but um, if we, there's, the, where did that, that one got messed up. Yeah, you don't want that one yet. And we don't want those guys anymore. If we share from the heart, we can touch the heart. And that's our passion. And that's, right now, it's a really, really good time in history to build bridges. There's a lot of division. But regenerative ag and the things that we do, we can really cross a lot of lines um, so I want to talk about how to build your elevator speech. William, have you been in an elevator yet? Three minutes tops, right? What kind of conversation can you have someone in three minutes? But if you can put what you love about ag, what, what you do in less than three minutes or three sentences, I want to work on that how to communicate your passion for regenerative agriculture, how to share your story of stewardship, and why you do what you do. The, to, I mean, some of us need to figure that out. I probably still do, but why do you do what you do? And if you can condense that and share that. Um, yeah, so back to not so favorite stuff. This was in, on Pinterest. It popped up on my wife's Pinterest a few days ago. How to sterilize soil to kill pests and diseases. And that's, um, I was so excited. Um, uh, you know, uh, people think that you have to kill stuff to grow stuff. And this is our media. It's, it's out there. And not everybody thinks this, but this is from well-intended folks. All right, but there's hope. Um, I love the Neil Young song. Uh, I know it's true because I saw it on TV. Anyone? Maybe. Uh, here's a popular TV show these days called Yellowstone. I'll all be boring and read it for you. You ever plow a field to plant the quinoa? I don't even know how to spell that. Sorghum or whatever the hell it is you eat. You kill everything on the ground and under it. You kill every snake, every frog, every mouse, mole, vole, worm, quail. You kill them all. So I guess the only real question is, how cute does an animal have to be before you care if it dies to feed you? Was it, a TV show? it will be. Um, <laughs> well, the the th yeah. And by the way, I love interaction. It keeps me from saying um too much. Uh, but the thing is, folks are eating this stuff up. They love this show and they love this message. And why is that? So here's another one, a movie Avatar. And maybe you went to see it, maybe you didn't. Um, 2009, second largest box office gross only to Gone with the Wind. And uh, people, it was out there in the news, people were telling their therapists that they wanted to go to this planet so they could get in touch with Awa, 
basically, they wanted to get in touch with the earth. Um, people want to be connected to the land. And people who don't feel connected to the land are missing something. I, most of us are just totally blessed because we're connected. And maybe, maybe we're having withdrawals because I'm a thousand miles from home right now. It's a lot warmer here. Uh, how, about, um, how about this? Well, I'll get out on a limb here. Oh, that's why these stories sell. We're connected to the land. They want to be connected to the land. So here's, here's one out there a little bit. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. When you hear heal their land, does that feel good? So I started off trying to insult you, but does, does that feel good? How about this one? Not so great. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You know, we came from the dust, we returned to the dust. We are the land, the soil. So maybe you've heard of Nicole Masters. If you haven't, you need to. Um, when she talks about geosmin, and to see if I can get it right, fury rings. You gotta say it, fury rings. Nobody knows what she's talking about, but she's so fun and so exciting you want to learn. And so what matters to you? People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. So this one is attributed to I don't know how many coaches and then, then of course maybe Teddy Roosevelt and probably some Greek theologist. But um, what are you passionate about? That back to the why you do what you do so paper or plastic, power stroke or Prius, tree hugger or timber jack. Uh, how can we tell our story and keep it, so here's the title, peanut butter and jelly, simple. It's people don't get some of the stuff we do, but if we, can, if we can condense it. It's not about money. Maybe some of you are only into ag for money. Um, we know that our soil building practices are, they make us more profitable. But uh, that's not our main driver. It's cool, but it's not our main driver. And this is the foundation of your elevator speech. So back to, yeah, can you meet somebody in the elevator, tell them the total passion of your life before they get to, <laughs> maybe they're gonna need 20 floors, I don't know, but it's a, it's a neat little cliche. Um, we want to do it because it's the right thing to do, but how do we share it? What one thing, picture, would explain or define your passion for the soil? Get the cool heart picture. The forage, the land, the planet, the world, the environment, your passion for your home. How do we explain to them, them, I guess that's a bad term because that means it's somebody else. How do we explain to our friends our, your passion? Most of society thinks that keeping off the grass is how we keep it nice. That the line, there's this sign on Mr. Green's yard because the kids always cut across his yard. And so we've grown up learning that keeping off the grass is how you save the grass. Maybe you have to mow it and you have to water it, but they don't know the grass that we know where we need to impact it. We need to graze it. We need to rest it, but if we leave it alone, it's going to die. That's an interesting conversation. Uh, 
How do we talk to strangers about pats or manure patties, whatever? Weeds. This one's particularly favorite. In uh, West Virginia last summer, everybody wanted to spray these weeds. And yet, what's the, the, our pollinators are in big trouble. There's worse words, but they're in big trouble. And there was bees, beautiful bees, on every one of these. And we dug up some roots, too. And they were doing other things under the ground. Was, ah, but so, yeah. Last time I got to talk here, I had a slide for preaching to the choir. We don't have to talk about regenerative ag. You guys know this. It's how do we talk to people who don't understand regenerative ag? Because the bees on those thistles, I get really emotional about. They're cool. And yeah, they're not weeds. And then wasted grass. Does anybody have that problem? How can you stomp all that grass? How can you not use all that grass? Cool, thank you. How can you not turn all that grass into hay? I mean, that, yeah, maybe we're gonna talk to people in the city because they're more receptive because our neighbors, not so much. How do we explain that all of these things lead to life? I didn't have a slide for this, but in West Virginia, we got to tour some really old stuff. And there was a graveyard there that was still in pristine condition. And of course, it was mowed and it was clean. And everything there was dead. You know, and then we toured some pastures where there was poop and weeds and unused grass and used grass and bugs and all kinds of things going on and fence that hadn't been fixed. But it was alive. And that, that's passionate. And it's a very different, different thing. How about, uh, what does sticking your tongue to the flag tool, flagpole have to do with uh, water sequestration? So if, if you ever got to go to school and fell for that joke, and I probably did, um, but by noon, all that frost that was on the flagpole is a puddle at the bottom of the flagpole. And every flagpole that we leave in our pastures is going to grab moisture. Maybe it doesn't even freeze to it, but it gets on there and it goes down and we hold on to that moisture. Whereas if it's that short, we don't, it just goes on by, goes somewhere, but it doesn't stay with us. So yeah, rancher or vegan, us versus them, to be or not to be. It comes down to right, wrong, different, or more importantly, perspective. It's, it's how we look at it. Or, you know, if I'm across from you, we're maybe confrontational just by nature because I'm facing you. But if I can sit down next to you and look at the same slide, now we're working together. We're thinking it through together. Big one out there. Paul McCartney's got Meatless Mondays. And has everybody heard of Frank Mitloner from UC Davis? He's got some amazing stuff going on. On uh, I'll say it out loud, William. Cow farts. It's a thing. Um, get the t-shirt. But more importantly, start the conversation. There's what we can do with ruminant animals and what we can do with monogastric animals and chickens is so much better than doing nothing. And we are sequestering carbon. We are saving the planet. What we know and what we think we know. We love the smell of fresh cut grass, there after the rain, and good soil. Most of the people who don't know ag love those things too. What is the difference between dirt and soil? Well, we could, this room would probably know. What is the difference between weeds and forage? Herbicide, insecticide, homicide, genocide. Fine lines in some circles, and it is perspective. Are we doing things right this time? Is everything we put into what we're doing on our ranch 
What if in 30 years it was wrong? Well, we, it's the best we've got. Uh, hmm. Should have given you that slide a while ago. But this is how to talk to people. Back to that uh, confrontational. Respond to emotional things by looking at the facts. Well, he's not a franker. He's not a doctor. Professor Frank out at UC Davis, he's got a lot of facts about cow farts and methane gas emissions. And when you can bring some facts, it can really slow down the emotions. And respond to the facts by checking their emotional impact. If someone's not very re receptive, maybe I'm not very receptive to those facts. How's it going to affect me if I don't want to hear it? If we slow down and listen a little bit. Yes, so doing it right. They used to tell us it was okay to dip the kids in DDT, and that, that didn't work out. But it was the hottest and most scientific thing at the time. I, I wasn't alive then, thank goodness. Um, William, this is tough, and this is an opinion of mine. We don't owe it to our kids. That's a, I think that's a silly line. We owe it to ourselves. We're either passionate about what we're doing or we're not. But if we are passionate about what we're doing, our kids are going to be passionate about it too. And I, I don't think we need to write checks that they have to cash. We should just do things that they want to continue. What do you hear when you think of home? Do you hear life? What is one word that you would describe the life that you hear? Okay, I'll cut you a break. You can use one sentence. Maybe. This is not like that sixth grade thing where you have to write a report because that locks me up solid. Um, how about three sentences? That one thing when you hear life or the one thing that's most important to you about what you do or your land or your livestock. The goal here is to condense the passion of what you love about your grazing operation, your regenerative ag operation. Boil it down, condense it, all the power, all the flavor, all the good, bad, and the ugly, and the life, especially the life, and be able to hand someone a tablespoon to taste. Yeah, so I'm not going to try to uh, make that work, but thank you for the little red dot. Dung beetles. I could probably gross out some seventh grade girls from town, but by the time I get talking to them about how passionate I am about dung beetles and the things that go inside cow manure, that's, that's pretty good. What's, what's corny and weird that you're passionate about that you can share with uh, the Uber driver that's going to take you back to the airport or, I don't know, gas station attendant? We don't get much time in an airplane, but there's a lot of people that we get to hang out with that we just need a little bit to share with them. And maybe it's what they need. They're going to go home and they'll be like, wow, I get to met this person. You wouldn't believe what they do. And it can make a huge difference. Yes. So, oh, look, cool. So, yeah, look at me. Rabbit trail. Sorry. I do love grass. Stock density. I think of the math on that was six pounds to the square foot, which some people can do a lot better. But I was pretty proud. Peach pit jelly. So my wife could make really good jelly. And uh, the peach jelly was fine. Or no, we just ate the peaches. But then she'd take all the junk that got thrown out, the uh, chicken scraps, boil that down and make peach pit jelly. Turns out that's an extremely powerful medicine. Uh, as in, 
what are you really passionate about in your ag, in your region? What, what drives you, the why? The, the thing that gets you, out, well, we could, yeah, cliche, what gets you out of bed in the morning? But can you condense it down to one cool little jar that people, people wanna hear about? So passion, belief, heart, in, in this room, in this industry, blood, sweat, and tears is a real thing. Uh, my hope is that uh, this presentation will encourage you to reach out to others, and maybe strangers. Um, share your passion uh, and tell your stewardship story. And if you're an introvert, well, maybe you just need a couple of words or a bumper sticker. I don't know. I don't know where I am on time, Jason. Five? So I'm good with questions or I can keep talking. Um, fun story. It's actually got this little one started. Is my mom used to tell me, go clean your room. And so I'd clean my room. And she'd show up a little bit later and be like, you're not doing it right. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I'm cleaning it. It's going to get clean. That's what matters. You know, um, I'm trying to save the planet. Well, you're not doing it right. Well, how do you know? I, I'm trying. Does it matter how we save the planet? How we build soil? How we raise better livestock? Well, yeah, a little bit. But as long as we're making forward progress and not taking advantage of our neighbors or that's, that's, that's pretty good stuff. Um, big thing here is threats to opportunities. That's Gus and Rue. And um, Gus is, you can tell what Gus is. Uh, <laughs> and Rue most of the time isn't quite so serious. But, you know, every, we all know somebody who's one of those dogs. Uh, and maybe each of us are one of those dogs at some point, somewhere. But how do you talk to somebody who's so... <laughs> and then, yeah, I'm going to tell you that uh, I've got cows and you're a vegan. I mean, I, how do you... But there's a way. There's a way to talk to people and share what we do. And... Um, if I had a question for any of you, what would scare you about talking to a stranger about what you do? Yeah, boy, that's, that's a quick way to feel silly, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's one. So could we, could we, impact our soils and graze very effectively with animals that don't ever get eaten? No. Oh, no, I think, I think it's possible. Yeah. yeah, maybe someone wants to help us pay for that. But, yeah. Um, someday, yeah, maybe it'll be. That's. That's pretty what, much what I have for you guys. Um, cool. Does anybody have any questions for Derek? Oh. Or comments or want to add to what he's <laughs> shared with us today? I think the Sand Hills has done you good. Makes you reflect and and really care about our land.